Hi, this is Owen Astrakhan for CompSci 201, and this is the Labor Day recording, which I hope you might not necessarily watch on Labor Day. Today, classes, objects, and P0, the Person 201 project that will go out later today and be due in a week. C is for class, which, as we'll see, and as we've seen, is a factory for creating objects. Class is the template. Objects are the instances that we create by calling new. C is also for collections and collection. We've seen some classes from java.util and we'll see more on Wednesday and as the course progresses. And C is for collaboration, working together when appropriate, which is almost all the time, except when we're having assessments. There's a first WOTO. All the WOTOs for today are optional. In fact, you'll get extra credit for doing them. And this is just a WOTO to see where you are with VS Code and Git. So you should put the video on pause and answer the WOTO. It's good until class starts on Wednesday. The details for this class and all classes can be found online via 201wo.to, the class URL and web page. This week, there are APTs due on Wednesday. I hope most of you have gotten a start or are done with those, and we'll see some of them in class on Wednesday. We've already done two of them together. Next week, P0 will be due on Monday, 9-11. You will always get 24 hours of extension, and this for this project, because it's the first one, you'll get an extra two-day extension. Next week, APTs will be due on Wednesday. Typically, APTs are due most Wednesdays. The plan for today and the arc of the week and today is renew, review enough Java to be able to do P0. What I don't want to have happen is that VS Code and Git get in the way, although they do. We want to take all the steps we can do to make sure Java doesn't get in the way. We'll review this as this video progresses and then again a little bit in class on Wednesday. Today we'll be emphasizing objects, classes, and strings and P0. Wednesday we'll talk about array list, arrays, and APTs. In Java, a class named foo must be stored in a file named foo.java. That's a language requirement. Typically, we use capital letters as the beginning of a class name, and that means that the file also begins with a capital letter because they must be the same. As we've said before in class, a class is an object factory. You create instances of the class by calling new. And a class encapsulates state and behavior. The state is the guts of the object. For example, a string is an array of characters. A point in 2D space would be, let's say, an X and a Y value. Those would be represented by doubles. That's the state. And we're going to see today a person to a one object that's part of P0. So the state is the guts and the differences between each instance of a class, and the behavior are the methods that go along with a class. For example, here we can see a string. A string s has been initialized to computer, and by calling the method dot to care array, we see the internal representation, although that's what is actually printed by calling to care array, the actual innards and guts of a string are a little more complicated. But we also see three string methods shown here. So the state is this array of character values. And the behavior is the set of methods that you can call. So there's a method dot length. We can see it returns the length or number of characters in the string. We know it's a method because it's followed by parentheses. We know it's a method because it's invoked with a dot operator on an object. So we see s dot length. The length method is invoked on the s object. The care at method returns the character given an index. That's another string method. In this case, it's invoked on the object to the left of the dot. And then we see s dot substring. And that's also a string method. In this particular case, when it's invoked on the s object, we can see that it is equal to put because we start at three and we go up to, but not including six. And incidentally, that means that simply subtracting allows us to determine the length of that substring. Six minus three is three. Start at three, include it. Go up to six, don't include it. Those are the indices three, four, and five. 
In the Person 201 class that you'll see in P0, a class also encapsulates state and behavior. The state is what makes up a Person 201 object for the purposes of this assignment. And that will be the name, a phrase associated with that person, and the latitude and longitude that are used in creating a Person 201 object. We're going to create instances of this class from class data, from course data. Sometimes the word class gets overused a little bit. And we'll make sure that there's some privacy and anonymity preserved if you use your real name and where you lived. You, when you submit some data, you can make up that data if you want. The purpose of P0 is to illustrate that most Java programs consist of more than one class, and those classes interact with each other. So you'll practice a multi-class project. You'll read files and URLs and encrypted versions of them. That code is given to you. You'll write some new code, and you'll practice with Git, which is the system that we use to maintain your code, and Gradescope, which is the system we use to grade your code. As we've said today, a class encapsulates state and behavior. Typically, that state is given by instance variables in the class. Sometimes those are just called variables. And we can see here that there are four instance variables. My name, my latitude, my longitude, and my phrase. Again, in Java, typically, instance variables are private. And we'll see what that means. But what it does mean is you cannot access these from outside the class. We also see here that two person 201 objects have been constructed. So there's a person 201 object named A, and it's constructed with the parameters Claire, 37.8, negative 122.2, and Courant. And then another person 201 object, B, the name is Ricardo, negative 1.2 for the latitude, 36 for the longitude, and Harambe for the phrase. And we can see that in this constructor, and we'll talk more about that on the next slide, the parameters to the constructor are used to initialize the instance variables. We can see here that the third parameter, that negative 122, is used, will be used to initialize the longitude. That's, that prefix of my is a convention. The instance variables can be named anything. Now, typically, you use a variable name that's indicative of its purpose. So name, latitude, longitude, and phrase, those make sense for the name, latitude, longitude, and phrase. And that prefix of my is meant to indicate that these instance variables are specific to an object. Claire's value of my name is Claire. Ricardo's value of my name is Ricardo. So those are specific to each instance of the class, just like for a string, apple is the encapsulation of the character array for the string apple, and sauce would be S-A-U-C-E for the string sauce. The constructor must be the same name as the class. We'll see it has no return type, and you can overload or have more than one constructor if they have different parameters. It's the purpose, and when you write code, you must ensure that purpose, that a constructor initializes all instance variables. The default constructor shown in this code indicates that there are no parameters, but still those instance variables need to be initialized. And as we see here, back on the previous slide, the default value of all instance variables in an object are for doubles, zero, for ints, zero, essentially zero for all primitive types, and for object types, like the string here, the default value will be null, N-U-L-L. -L. That's a value that's indicated by the reserved word null, and it means there is no object. Recall that object variables, such as my name and my phrase, are references to a location in memory that actually stores, in this case, the strings for my name and my phrase. If you don't specifically assign a value to them, they don't point or reference anything. That's what null means. There's no reference. And if you don't specify an object for them to reference, 
they will point at or reference null or nothing. The string class and the person to a one class are both immutable. That means they can never change. So the state can't be changed by invoking a method. Now typically, you can't change the state of something by simply accessing the instance variable because they're private. But often, you can, you can change the state by calling a method that changes the internal guts of something. We'll see that with ArrayList, for example. But for strings and person 201 objects, you cannot change them. You can create new ones, but you can't change them. Instead, you use methods for strings, s.carat, s.startsWith. For person to a one objects, p.getName, p.distanceFrom. And you'll see those when you look at the person to a one p0 code. Again, the methods define the behavior. You cannot write p.myName in client code because the client code, meaning outside the class person to a one, cannot access private instance variables or even private methods. Sometimes there are private methods. Client code can only access public methods. So here we see the public method getName returns the value of the instance variable my name. Now that means it returns Claire for Claire, the string Claire, and the string Ricardo. Once you have those values, you could print them, you could look at them as a client code, but you can't change them because you're not given a reference, simply a copy to what's inside the class. We also see another method here, toString. We'll talk about this a little more on the next slide, but the key, as you'll see there, is all classes have a toString method, but the default version that you get isn't always too useful. So in this case, we see the at override, and that's an indication that we're giving a new implementation rather than the default one we inherited. More on inheritance as the course progresses. In this case, the toString variable will ensure that when a person to a one object is printed, that instead of a negative value for latitude or longitude, we see west or east or north or south for negative values. So we can see here in the code where we're looking at the return type, which is a string, and internally in the code, we see that a latitude that's negative will have the string s added after it. So when you print a person to a one object, in the southern hemisphere, negative latitudes, it will say s. In the northern hemisphere, it will say n for north. And you can see that on line 82, the absolute value of the latitude is taken so that internally it's stored as a negative value. But when you print it, it's printed with an S or an N. Again, the string method we'll see is called automatically in some situation, the two string method. And that's an example of what's called inheritance that we'll be studying as the course progresses. Here is an example from code that's part of P0 in one of the demo programs that uses person 201 object. And here we see that by printing all four values of the array people, and we can see on line 11 that the array people has four values, A, B, C, and then a new value is constructed inside that array assigned to the variable people. When we loop over all the values of people, and print them by simply saying println p. The way Java works is by printing something, the toString method is automatically called. You don't have to be explicit in calling it. And what you will have, what you'll see on the screen here is that the toString method that we saw here is called, meaning a formatted string is given. The default value that you get if you didn't override it doesn't do much. In fact, it prints the internal memory location, which isn't so useful. The final thing we need to understand for understanding the Java for that's part of P0 is that reserved word static. Remember, for example, that the launch point for Java programs is a public static void main, sometimes called PSVM. And what we see there is that the visibility 
of the program of the method is public. We've already seen that instance variables are typically private. Methods are typically public, meaning client code can call them. So in public static void main, the visibility is public. The return type is void. It doesn't return anything. The name of the method is main, and it must have these specific parameters if it's the launch point for a Java program. We won't typically use those parameters. Finally, public void main, the static is that this method belongs to a class, not an object. So let's see some examples. Math.square root of 25. The square root method is part of the math class. We can see it's a method because it has parentheses, and we see that it's invoked with a dot operator. But to the left of that dot, we see the class name, not an object name, as we saw, for example, with s.length for strings. We know it's a class name because it begins with a capital letter. We've seen briefly that there's an arrays class, and the arrays class has a two-string method that ensures that an array is printed in a nice way. Again, two-string is typically a method that acts on something and returns a string for printing purposes. In math.square root, the square root of 25 is calculated by an algorithm and code that's internal to the square root method. There's no state, no difference between the square root of 25 and the square root of 36. The same algorithm is used. So the parameters are all that are needed to compute math.square root or compute arrays.toString. There's no internal state as we saw in person 201 or string. You'll see in the, in the P0 project that there is a person 201 utilities.read file method. We know, as you'll see in the code, that it's a method. We don't see it being invoked here with parentheses, but we do see it to the, with a dot to its left, and we know that it's a class name, person 201 utilities, because it begins with an uppercase character. So again, static means it belongs to a class, not an object. An object is something like, for strings, s.length. For person 201, something like get name. And classes have static methods, meaning you can invoke them without creating an object. This WOTO will be about what we've just seen. Please put the video on pause, take some time to answer those WOTO questions, and we'll go over them in class on Wednesday. Finally, one example of informal and formal reasoning that we'll be using throughout the course, but we've seen now that strings are immutable. And sometimes your intuition fails. And we're going to see here why and why formal reasoning, as well as informal reasoning and intuition, are useful, but you've got to check one with the other. So what we see here is a Java method named concat. It has two parameters, a string, and a number of repetitions, or reps. We can see in the code for concat that the number of loop iterations is given by that second parameter, reps. We can see that the for loop starts at zero, goes up to but not including reps, and is incremented by one. That means the number of loop iterations is specified by that second parameter. So on this slide, we see two calls. Start with the string hello, and concatenate it to itself a hundred times, that would give you hello, 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 ho, with a hundred occurrences. And the second invocation, string t gets concat hello a thousand, is a thousand concatenations of hello. So it'd be hello repeated a thousand times. That's a string that's 5,000 characters long. The first call gives you a string that's 500 characters long. So the number of loop iterations changes by a factor of 10 from a hundred to a thousand. But how long does it take this code to execute? That's going to depend on the time of that statement to execute. Ret plus gets or plus equals s. Ret started as the empty string, and I'm going to concatenate to that string over and over again, hello in this case, because that's the first parameter. How long does it take to execute? Well, we could reason about it and say, well, we know the loop takes 10 more times more between 100 and 1,000. Maybe the time takes 10 times more between 100 and 1,000. So for example, if the first call 
to create S of 500 characters takes five seconds, we're assuming that, how long does it take to concatenate hello a thousand times? Because we've increased the number of repetitions by 10, maybe the time goes up by a factor of 10. That would be 50 seconds. But maybe it goes up by a factor of 100, that's 10 squared. Maybe it's 500 seconds. What does it depend on? Well, we can actually time this code using Java methods for timing, but we can also reason about it. We're going to do both here. First, here are some timings because I've used the same example for the last three times I've taught 201. And we can see that in 2020, concatenating a string to itself 500,000 times took 2.44 seconds. And that time decreased to 2021 and to 2023. Essentially, with a new laptop, your time speeds up. And we can see that those times did speed up for 500,000 seconds. When we go back to 50,000 seconds, timings aren't always reliable. Like, why did the timing go down and then up in 2023 from 0.11 to 0.13? Those timings may not be totally reliable on an individual basis. But as we'll see, the trends are reliable. So these are graphs done by Excel for the data that you just saw. This data, these data, are shown here. And you can see that the lower curve is the curve for this year. And that's a pretty smooth curve. And if you look very closely, you'll see that it's given by a quadratic, something times x squared, with an indication that it's a very good fit. 0.978 is a very good fit. In the previous years, we also see quadratic behavior with a few anomalies. The dots don't necessarily fit right on that quadratic curve that was given by asking Excel to fit a quadratic curve. But these are quadratic curves. The time goes up quadratically. And as we'll see, that's not fast. Quadratic is slow. Even though, as we saw here, the time to do 500,000 concatenations isn't too bad, 1.54 seconds, that's still going to be too slow as the size scales. Now, why is it quadratic? Well, recall, strings are immutable. Once they're created, they cannot change. So here's an example with three separate strings. We've created the string S1, it's hello. S2 is S1 plus hello. We know that's hello plus hello. That's a string of 10 characters. And then we see that S3 is S2 plus hello. That's a string of 15 characters. So the total amount of storage that is created is 5 for S1, 10 for S2, and 15 for S3. Each of those strings encapsulates the state of 5 characters for S1, 10 for S2, 15 for S3. That's a total of 30 characters. And every time you allocate storage for a character, it takes time. Now, this is slightly different than the code we saw, which concatenates a string to itself. But it turns out there's no difference because strings are immutable. So in this code, what happens is S is hello because it says string S gets hello. Now, the statement S gets S plus hello doesn't change the storage of S that's in place before it's executed. Remember, you cannot change a string. So the code s plus hello, when s is hello, means there's a new string created, hello, hello, a string of 10 characters. And the variable s on the left now references or points to a 10 character string. The five character string that s used to reference can no longer be accessed. That storage is lost. Now Java is smart and will reclaim it. But that means we initially allocated five characters for hello. And then S gets S plus hello makes S reference a string of 10 characters. And then when I say, please add another hello to that to make 10 plus 5 or 15, we'll see that the final S is hello, hello, hello. The final length is 15. But the total amount of storage allocated, just as on the previous slide, was 5 plus 10 plus 15, or 30. 
And if we generalize and scale to n strings being concatenate, concatenated, we'll see that the first string is 5, the next one is 10, the next one is 15. The size of those strings keeps going up by 5. If we do that n times, the last string is 5n long. 100 hellos is 500. 1,000 hellos is 5,000. And if we do simple math and factor out a 5, we'll see that's 5 times 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 plus n. Now the sum of the numbers from 1 to n is given by the formula n times n plus 1 over 2. And if you multiply n times n plus 1 over 2, you'll see that's roughly n squared. n times n, after all, is n squared. Now there's some trailing terms, but n squared is the dominant term. 5n squared is the runtime. That's done analytically by looking at how long it takes each statement to execute. We also did it empirically by timing, and we saw that those curves were in fact quadratic. Now, Java, because strings are immutable, has very slow behavior for string concatenation. In Python, there's a special case that avoids this, and in Java, there's an alternative class, String Builder, that you'll use when you want to concatenate more efficiently. That illustrates both the intuition and the formal and informal and empirical and analytical reasoning around string concatenation, and also brings for, forward what immutable means. You can't change a string, you can only make new ones. The computer scientist for today is Fred Brooks, who passed away in 2022. He won the Turing Award, which is the Nobel Prize for Computer Science in 99. He founded the UNC Computer Science Department as one of the very first computer science departments in the country in 64. He wrote a book called The Mythical Man Month in 1975, and he was the Duke valedictorian in 1953. So he had some dark and light blue allegiances as an undergrad at Duke, but as a member of a founding member of the computer science department at UNC. There's an interesting quote about what he thinks the most important thing he did is. And he says, the most important single decision I ever made was to change the IBM 360, that's a series of computer, from a 6-bit byte to an 8-bit byte, thereby enabling the use of lowercase letters. That change propagated everywhere. And today we still have 8-bit bytes, and we do have lowercase and uppercase letters. Uh, Dr. Brooks was a, a, a loose friend of mine in some ways. Um, it turns out that a million years ago when I was a high school teacher, I taught his daughter, and he was very nice to me over time, and I appreciated uh, getting to know him a little bit as I became a computer scientist f rather than a math teacher. He also has a great quote about why programming is fun. And here's what he says. First is the sheer joy of making things. Second is the pleasure of making things that are useful. Third is the fascination of fashioning complex puzzle-like objects of interlocking moving parts. Fourth is the joy of always learning. And finally, there is the delight of working in such a tractable medium. The programmer, like the poet, works only slightly removed from pure thought stuff. I hope you'll embrace and learn to appreciate some of these things as you embark on the programming parts of CompSci 201. Now I mentioned that Dr. Brooks passed away this past year and that, as you see, he was a writer, an educator, and a scientist. Now just two weeks ago, Craig Enriquez, who also was a Duke graduate, both in Pratt and a PhD, and then a scientist and an educator and a, and a reasonably good friend also passed away. I also taught his daughter in CompSci 201. I taught Dr. Brooks's daughter in when I was a high school math teacher. And it's sad, obviously, when people are no longer with us, but we remember what they've done. And hopefully that can bring you some joy even when there's sadness. Enjoy this lecture. I hope Duke will do well in the football game that's going to happen this evening. Might have already happened when you watch this video. I'll see you in class on Wednesday.